guys, welcome back to Luke 18, Lesson 62. Uh, hard to imagine that we have had an opportunity to just walk through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and nearing really the end of the Gospel of Luke, and just trying to paint a picture of Jesus known as, and we'll get to that at the very end of our story again today, Jesus is known as the Son of Man in the Gospel of Luke. And just as a, as a gentle picture here that uh, Mindy Oat, my cousin, has painted, it's really cool, the Son of Man, what I like about this image is that Jesus is willing to engage people. Like he, He's not a distant God. He's not this, this God that doesn't interact. No, He became God in human flesh. And He invites everybody to the table. In fact, He took away uh, the main issue that we had, which was the fall of man. And what did He do? He redeemed it. He restored it. And He gives us an opportunity to come to the table to experience full healing. And I, I love this because I think sometimes when we think about God, we don't think He's approachable. I think sometimes when we think about this almighty creator, we just think, oh yeah, it's, it's God the creator. There's no way he made trees, but we can't connect with him. What I love is, is that God actually wants to connect. God wants to have a relationship. And when you look at these first eight verses in Luke 18, and again, we're not going to cover the entire chapter, you're going to see that really the father wants to have a relationship with his kids. And so there's this picture of what this could look like. In Luke 18, verse 1, it says, And he, meaning Jesus, told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. So I'm just going to write up here already the phrase, pray always. <laughs> uh, guilty. Not doing this all the time. I don't pray always. I'd like to think I do. I have this thought process that I take my things, my thoughts and my, uh, my words before the Lord sometimes, but... I'd love to say always, but I, I think it's important that we need to pray always in order to how? Not become discouraged. So how do you, can I just tell you already, how do you already fight discouragement in your life? How do you fight depression? How do you fight uh, the, the woes of your life? Well, Scripture says you, you pray always. In everything, give thanks. Scripture says you keep on praying, right? It's this mentality of giving thanks and being pray and prayerful. So... You know, we could literally camp out on this verse on how to fight the enemy just by, by praying. So it says this in verse 2. He gives you a scenario, scenario about a parable. This parable is going to be about praying. So there's a judge in one town, and this judge didn't fear God or respect man. Okay, so I think it's a fair statement. If you're coming into town, this judge who doesn't fear God or respect man, probably not a believer. Okay, so here you have a non-believing judge. That's your backdrop, okay? Now in verse 3, when the scripture continues on, and a widow in that town came, kept coming to him. So this widow, widow just means that this person lost their spouse. So in a, in a, in a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. So obviously an adversary, probably an enemy of some form, would you bring relief and take away this situation? Judge, I am tired of this. Take away this situation. Now, I want to talk about a widow just for a second, because I think this is crazy. A widow um, over and over. In fact, Luke mentions widows more than all of the gospel writers combined. He has a heart for widows. Not only in the Old Testament do they write about widows, but also in the New Testament. So let's just... Let's just kind of use this as a little bit of a backdrop here. First of all, Psalm 68, verse 5, my favorite verse on widows. A lot of people don't necessarily even go to this verse, but it's a cool picture. God in his holy dwelling is a father of the fatherless. And look what God is. He's a champion of the widows. Like God wants to look out for those who don't have support. He wants to look out for who've lost their best friend. Kevin, if you would, would you go to uh, James 1, verse 27? James 1.27, we, we've heard this many, many times, talking about what religion looks like. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after ordo, uh, or, ordos. That's combining orphans and widows at this time. When you look after ordos, oh yeah, it's a new ministry name we're starting. Ordos. To look, somebody will probably start a ministry called that now. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unsustained by the world. So, what this implies is that there's orphans and widows in their distress. There are going to be people that just need help. 
That's what James is talking about. They need help in this context. So here you have a widow coming to a non-believing judge asking for justice from their adversary. Like we need to be ones that are willing to help. And the scripture says pure and undefiled religion before our God is that we should be taking care of these people. Okay, just a couple other ones here. Can you go to, uh, let's go to Luke just for a second here. Kevin, go to Luke 7 verse 12. I just want to show you something here. I think this is kind of cool. Uh, in Luke 7 verse 12, it says this, and he, he was his mother's only son and she was a widow. Go to Luke 20 verse 47. Remember I said Luke mentioned widows the most? There's just certain themes. I know it's not the son of man, but I think this is a really cool one. They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. This is talking about the religious. We'll get into that. The religious seek after the widows. They devour after them. Why? Because they want something from them. And scripture says we're supposed to do the opposite and take care of the widows. And so over and over again, you have it in Luke 2, Luke 4, Luke 7, Luke 20, Luke 21. He writes about the widows. And so now here you have back in Luke 18, if we can go back there, a widow comes before an unbelieving judge saying, please give me justice against my adversary. Now, here's the one problem already, already that this widow has with her judge. Three things, as Wearsby says. One, she's a woman. That's a problem in itself in that context back then. Not because she's a female, but people don't listen to women. Two, she's a widow. So it doesn't like, she doesn't have like a, somebody to speak up for, right? Like it's the widow and her voice. And three, she's probably poor and probably couldn't pay a bribe to get the judge to do what she needed to do. So here you have a, a woman, a widow and a poor. She is fighting three major obstacles in coming before the judge before she's even done anything. Just by the label. Interesting enough, it just says this in verse four, it says, for a while he was unwilling, meaning the judge who didn't fear God and had no respect of man. In other words, he doesn't really care about man. He doesn't really care about the situation. He doesn't care about what God's going to say. He doesn't care what God's going to think. Yet in verse five, this is the best. Because this widow keeps pestering me. I just chew fly, don't bother me. Like it's that mentality, like just go away because she keeps coming to me. I will give her justice. Why? So she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. <laughs> what an awesome picture. I mean, think about this. Wearsby says, if an insensitive judge will respond to a continual request, how much more will God respond to those who believe? So what I want to do is I want to, I want to do a little chart here that I think Wearsby does is really, really cool. So here you have a widow, right? And then at the same time, I want to talk about what would it look like if the elect, okay, his chosen people that, you know, uh, or just if we just want to put believers, whatever label you want to have, okay, in that, okay? Uh, I want to talk about the difference. Imagine, right? So a widow who is a stranger to the judge, the judge doesn't know her at all probably, or doesn't even care, right? And so therefore, because she's a stranger, really doesn't have access to the judge. Okay, these are a couple problems already that this woman has. And then obviously I mentioned this earlier, uh, she didn't have an advocate. So here you have a widow, a stranger, no access to the judge, doesn't have an advocate. Now imagine, think about this, Think about a child of God. We have open access to God. <laughs> and then we know this one. We have an advocate. His name is Jesus and he's sitting at the right hand of the father. So like when you hear a widow and she's all of these things and the judge still responds, imagine how much more does he want to respond to us? It's a cool tie in here. and We'll get into that here in a little bit. But just think about this, right? <laughs> I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent, by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said in verse six, listen to what the unjust uh, judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay to help him? help them. I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find that faith 
on earth. So here you have the widow comparison and now he's saying, yeah, but look, look what happens. Look what happens if you start praying like this. And I kind of want to go to, we're going to really start emphasizing our prayer life. I want to talk about our prayer life in, in order to get ready for when the Son of Man comes. This is all in preparation. Do you remember we talked about the now and the future? How we as a citizen of the kingdom of God can tap into this authority. We're tapping into this power. I'm telling you right now, that's what we're talking about. How is one of the ways that you tap into it? Through the power of prayer. And this power of prayer, what does it do in verse 8? It gets us ready for when the Son of Man comes. So by tapping into praying always, let's just tell you the end of the result. The Son of the Man, Son of Man is coming. And so we can, I don't know, it's just almost like we're, we're ready. We can expect and know that he's coming. So in order to get ready, we have to pray always. Now, how, how do you do this? Well, let's go to the obvious verses. We'll kind of get some of these verses in the back of our, on our belt. So we have these tools ready to use. And so Kevin, can you go to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 through 18? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. How, how do you have this mentality? Well, first of all, Paul writes, rejoice always. Like in everything, rejoice. It continues on in verse 17. Pray constantly. Rejoice always, pray constantly. And then what does it say in verse 18? Give thanks in everything. So what is the will of God? This is, will, this is God's will for you in Christ. You rejoice, right? You pray always. And what else do we do? We give thanks. As we give thanks, that literally gets us ready, according to verse 18, for the return of the Son of, of the man, of the Son of Man. Now, how do you keep on praying? Well, I'm going to tell you real, something real practical, and it's not a rabbit trail. You got to treat your wife well. You have to treat your wife well. Kevin, can you go to 1 Peter 3, 7? I, I am convinced that many of us, our prayers are not answered. We're not praying because we're not treating our wives like we're supposed to. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with an understanding of their weaker nature. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, Scripture says there is a weaker nature there. Yet, what do you do? Showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life. Why do we treat them as co-heirs of the grace of life? So that your prayers will not be hindered. So if we're supposed to be praying always, rejoicing, giving thanks, what's something else that we're supposed to be doing? Can I just tell you this? Treat your wife as a co-heir. And then you know what happens? Your prayers are not hindered. Sounds like a crazy tie-in, but I'm telling you, I actually believe that we do not see a move of God in some of the local churches based on bad marriages. I think bad marriages are getting in the way of our prayers being answered. Can you imagine treating your spouse one way and then you come to the Lord like nothing's happened? You imagine yelling at your spouse and you're impatient with your spouse. And I got to tell you, we all have been there. <laughs> All of us have our moments. So I'm not saying nobody's perfect. I'm just saying, guys, these are the things we got to work on in order for us to continue to come before the judge so he'll listen. And I have no problem saying you keep on pestering the Lord in your prayer life. Kevin, can you go to Matthew 7, verse 7? Matthew 7, verse 7 says this. Keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open. Verse 8, then it explains this whole process. For everyone who asks, receives. You, you know what this means, right? It doesn't just mean some. It says everyone who asks, receives. The one who searches, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Verse 9. What man among you, and I love this picture. What man among you, if his son asks him for a bread. So if my little boy Jude says, hey, I'd like a piece of bread. Well, here you go, Jude. Have a stone. No, if he get, asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. No, if you then who are evil, that would be us, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In verse 12, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. This is the law and the prophets. So the scripture says, you keep on asking. So what you actually hear from a widow who's a stranger, no access to the judge, didn't have an advocate, should actually encourage us as children of God, we have open access to the Father. We have an advocate. And imagine what God wants to pour out on his people. And I want to just make sure somebody understands something. Like, can you say things in repetition? Like, can you keep praying over and over and over? Yeah, as long as it's not gibberish. 
Like Matthew 6, can you go there? Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. This is not the type of prayer that we're talking about. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Or verse 8, don't be like them because your Father knows the things you need before you ask them. So in verse 7, don't babble, don't do this just for the sake of like, hey, somebody else is going to see me doing this. Like that's not what we're, we're talking about. Now I will tell you, how many times in the Garden of Gethsemane did Jesus pray? At least three times, right? Elijah prayed seven times on certain scenarios. David, or Daniel, excuse me, he prayed 21 days. So like, don't get in this mindset, I have to pray one time and then it's done. Like repetition before the Almighty is actually good. I'm gonna give you some of my, uh, some of my, I would say, men of God that I have always looked up to in the area of, of prayer. Uh, you guys have heard me saying this many, many times, but you know, Ian Bounds is one of my favorites, hands down. And Ian Bounds, I'm just going to read this. He says, you know, we're ever ready to excuse our lack of earnest and toilsome praying by a fancied and delusive, uh, delusive view of submission. We often end praying, this is huge, just when we ought to begin. We quit praying when God waits and is waiting for us to pray, really. <laughs> We're deterred by obstacles from praying or we succumb to difficulties and call it submission to God's will. Our praying, Ian Bound says, needs to be pressed and pursued with an energy that never tires, a persistency which will not be denied, and a courage. Like, that's the kind of prayer that I want to get to. I want my kids to know, oh yeah, my dad, uh, yeah, I'd love to know them as I, I love doing hobbies and sports, but I'd love to know them, have them know me as like, a, he was a man of prayer. I don't know if I'm labeled as that to my family. You know, Charles Spurgeon, he says, if you are sure it is a right thing for which you're asking, plead now, plead at noon and plead on with cries and tears spread out your case before the Lord. You hear what he says? Plead now, plead at noon, and you plead on. Over and over. George Mueller, this is what he says, It's not enough to begin to pray, nor to pray aright, nor is enough to continue for a time to pray, but we must pray patiently, believing, continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. Now that answer might not be what we're praying for, but God wants to show up in our lives. Think about the widow Stranger, no access to the judge, didn't have an advocate, but we are children of God, open access to the Father, and we have an advocate. So how on earth do we, okay, can we just say this? How on earth do we, what does it say in verse uh, 8, Kevin? If you can go there, uh, in Luke 18, verse 8, it says, I tell you, he will grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when he, will he find that faith on earth. How do you and I, as people of prayer, get to the point where He will find that type of faith in our lives? When we pray, do we function in that faith? I think they go hand in hand. If you have, if you have and function in the gift of faith, I actually really believe you have to function in the power of prayer. Because otherwise, you're just always dreaming and then you're never talking to Him. And so a couple scenarios, I mean, it's kind of like, gosh, where, where do we start? in this scenario with anything that we've done in cities. I mean, if you were just to take the one example of, of even just finances, on, on an every two week basis, I mean, I'll just be honest, I don't know how God does it. But my persistency, our team's persistency, our donors' persistency, and just talking to the Lord saying, Lord, would you continue to provide for Tom Revive? Would you continue to provide for Revive School? Like, I actually feel like I'm the widow that doesn't stop. And I'll be honest, characteristics of widows that are constantly coming before the Lord in power of prayer, you know what usually happens? You kind of get tired. Yeah, you might be determined enough, but over the course of time, it's just like, I don't, I don't know if I can just keep going. I'm tired of, of praying. I'm tired of getting on my knees. I'm tired of, you name it, it just feels like that's what it is. And, and yet, as a result of persistency, God just says, okay, Kyle, I'll continue to do this. I don't understand his timing. I have no understanding of why and when he does what he does. So how do we increase our faith? You know, Jeff, you were talking about, I think maybe it was, maybe it was yesterday. I don't know, maybe it's today too. It could have been. 
You know, that when we have and function in this power of prayer, I think it was when we were talking about the kingdom of God, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, there's an initial deposit, right? There's this seed that deposits in our DNA. When we become a citizen of the kingdom of God, we have what's called the faith of a mustard seed, right? This faith of a mustard seed. In fact, Kevin, can you go there? Luke 17, verse 5 through 6. So if he's looking for faith, you have to understand a couple things. Uh... Let's, uh, Kevin, you know what? I'm sorry. Go to Matthew 17, verse 19 through 20. So remember, if he's looking for, if he's looking for our faith, well, we have to understand, we have to start off with faith as a mustard seed. Right? Uh, verse 20, if you can. Uh, because of your little faith, he says, I assure you, in verse 20 of Matthew 17, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, so if he's looking for, let's go back to Luke 18, verse 8. The Son of Man is coming back. What is he looking for? For faith that's here on earth. So we have to understand, first and foremost, we have to have faith of a mustard seed. Mustard seed are like super small. <laughs> like, don't worry if it's not large, if it's not big, just start off small. But then what? Kevin, if you would, we need to begin praying. If, go Now you can go to Luke 17, verse 5, that the Lord would actually increase our faith. I talked about this with our team before because I really believe any, any situation we can get through when you have the gift of faith. I really believe that. In Luke 17, verse 5, if you would, the apostles said to the disciples, what? increase our faith. And what does he do in verse six? He reminds them, you have the faith of a mustard seed. So how do you increase your faith? Go back to, as weird as it sounds, I have faith already in me. I already have the faith of a mustard seed inside of me. Go to Luke 18, verse eight. I got to keep emphasizing this to you guys. If this is what he's looking for from his children of God, what is he looking for? He's looking for people, children of God, that have this type of faith, that don't stop coming before him. Will he find that faith on earth? Like this widow that says, please take my adversary and give me justice. He's looking for those that have this radical faith that if I keep going, God's going to show up. And so what do you do with this? How do you increase your faith? Okay, well, number one, uh, number three, I should say, is you got to remember something. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10 verse 17 says, so faith comes from what is heard. What is heard comes through the message about Christ. Man, this is awesome. So faith comes by hearing the Word of God. If you are in the Word of God, and if you're audio, you listen to it audio, or if you read it out loud, or if you just read it, faith comes by knowing Him. You can't grow in the Lord if you're not increasing your faith in the Word of God. So here's what I've concluded about the American church. We want our faith to increase, but just don't make me read the Word of God. Or have somebody else give me the Word of God on a, on a weekly basis, maybe every two weeks, summertime's coming in, so we might go every three weeks to church. And so because of that, we don't even get fed every day. I'm telling you, <laughs> you can increase your faith simply by being in the Word of God every day. That's how you fight through this. That's how you fight through life. You ask the Lord, increase our faith. And he says, okay, I will. Read the Gospel of Luke, please. Okay, I will. Read Deuteronomy. Okay, I will. Maybe read Leviticus. Like, the point is, anytime you're in the Word of God, anytime it's about the message of Christ, your faith will increase. So when the Son of Man is looking for a person who functions in this consistent, persistent faith, you have to know it's not just in praying. You know what it's also is? It's in the Word of God. And so as you hear the Word of God, what does it say in James 1 verse 22? As you hear the Word of God, as you want to increase your faith, you got to do it. Be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Oh yeah, I believe in the Word of God. I believe God's going to show up. But then you never do it. You'll never increase your faith unless you actually act on your faith. I think it's crazy to me, you guys. I hear all of these people say, God can do this, God can do this. And then they don't even try. They don't even walk it out. But if we're a citizen of the kingdom of God, like we talked about yesterday, now, like now we are a child of God. Now we are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You can actually walk out the power that's inside of you. 
I love what one commentator says. Okay, but you can be a doer of the word, but as you do this, do not forget to test the word. Malachi 3, 9 through 11. So, okay, God, this is what I've heard, but then you gotta, you got to put it to the test. And in verse 10, if you would, Kevin, I want you to do this. He says, bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, he says. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Just see by faith if I will show up. So he says, test the word. And then in this, if you go to Hebrews 11, 1, I, I love this. Hebrews 11, 1, it just says this. That's when it becomes reality. When you begin to do and test this thing out, now, faith is the reality of what things, of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. And so what we walk for by faith, we now actually have proof that God showed up. And that whole widow thing, coming before the judge, coming before the judge, coming before the judge, because she kept coming before the judge, guess what happened? God finally said, I'll pour out my storehouse and I'll give you justice. That to me is what I see in Scripture it's a pretty cool picture of what this looks like. And just, just remember this. We can do all of this because of Hebrews 4, verse 16. <laughs> we can approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may have... Mer we, well, go back to verse 15, will you, once, Kevin? Uh, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. So because of the Son of Man existing here on earth, He understands our heart. He understands where we're coming for. That's why in verse 16 then it says, then we can approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we can receive mercy and grace to help us at the proper time. Because the Son of Man came to us and let us sit at the table. He says, now you can come to me. Because I died and buried and came back to life, you can come to me and I'll give you mercy. I'll give you grace. But in this process, go to Luke 18, verse 1. I think this is really key. He told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. The way you're going to combat the discouragement in every life, everyday life, remember this, and the way to fight this discouragement is just keep coming to Him. I don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to look like. But I promise you, He wants to bless us. I promise you, He wants to give us the desires of His heart. And how long should we be praying like this? Kevin, can you go to Psalm 116, verse 2? Psalm 116, verse 2. Until, remember this, this is kind of cool. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call out to him as long as I live. As long as I can actually articulate and breathe and say, God, I need you. Until the Son of Man comes back, I'm going to keep praying and walking by faith. I'm going to keep praying in faith. That's what the Son of Man is looking for. I want to be the persistent widow. I want you to be the persistent widow that is literally crying out in faith because that's what he's looking for. All right, guys, Luke 18, Lesson 62. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.